I'm Lauren Kling, and this is 5 Things That Changed Your Life. Each episode, I sit down with a special guest and ask them to share five stories, events, or experiences that had an impact on their life, like a person who helped them decide a path to take, or a place that completely transformed the way they think. Perhaps it was inspiration from a family road trip or a childhood TV show that helped them to make the person they are today. This week's guest, Chris Gore. I was raised by very strong women. I say this in a way that some might say, I was raised by wolves. My mother was single mom, you know, when I was nine Mm -hmm. years old, my father left. My grandmother, very strong personality. Um, And I had two aunts who were very influential. I I don't know that I would 100% describe myself as a feminist then, but after my daughter was born, absolutely. Joining me as always is my producer, Alan Ng. Hi. How's it going, Alan? It's going great. I can't believe we finally made it <laughs> to this point. We finally made it. And the reason why we're saying that is uh, we recorded all 12 episodes already, but we're not putting them all out there at once. We're going to release one each week right. on Wednesdays. Our first guest is Chris Gore. Yes. And uh, so you might know Chris from G4's Attack of the Show. Right? Yeah, I was a big fan of that show, uh, and I know Chris very well from that show. From the, right, right. He had his DVDs days mm-hmm. where he would uh, give some interesting reviews about DVD releases. I know, it's kind of funny. Uh, it's, he would basically review current movies, and then he would pull out a box of DVDs and do kind of rapid fire reviews of whatever DVD showed up in that box. Right. So he was on that show. Um, he also wrote a book with his daughter called uh, Celebrity Poops. Yeah. And I really need to get that book. <laughs> I mean, it just sounds really fascinating. Yeah. And, and Chris was also the founder of Film Threat Magazine, which in uh, the 80s and the 90s uh, was the main source for independent filmmaking mm-hmm. and reviews. Yeah, and we talk a little bit about how that came about and uh, what led up to uh, him wanting to do that. We asked Chris to give us the five things that changed his life, and those things are? Number one, seeing Star Wars for the first time. Number two, the women who raised him. Number three, the birth of his daughter. Number four, the death of his father. And number five, the origin of Film Threat magazine. But we weave in and out of these topics so much. But they're jumping off points yeah, for yeah, the definitely. conversation. Yeah, I mean, I was particularly impressed. We talked about the women in his life, and we played the clip for there. Um, you know, because I was, I, I come from a household of boys, and now I live in a household full of women. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's just interesting to hear him talk about that and how that, I, that definitely changed my perspective on, on women. All right, here you go. Here's the interview with Chris Gore. That's amazing. <laughs> All right, so one of the many nerdy things that you enjoy, uh, you mentioned Star Wars. And one of your... I know of- it's... Uh, for, first of all, let me... I know it's not very popular. I know it's kind of a radical thing to say. But yes, I like Star Wars. Well, mine's so. Cannonball Run, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> Yours is more exciting. So, right. but seeing Star Wars for the first time now, are we talking about the original when it came out? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was a life altering experience seeing the first movie. It's also a, a, a shared life altering experience for a lot of people, whether they saw it in the theater for the first time or whether they, whether they saw a VHS copy at home or, right. or, or caught it on television. But, but that is a, a life altering experience. It's, it's, it was something that once I saw it, I had to, I mean, I wanted to know everything about who made it. How did they make it? How was it done? It was, and 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 when you know everything about the making of the original Star Wars, I'm not talking about the special editions. It was literally every technique in film that could possibly be used to tell a story all at once. I mean, it was brilliant. Everything from matte paintings to practical effects and forced perspective and models and makeup and it, it's 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 brilliant. You could you could you could study that movie alone and learn every technique up to that time based on that one movie alone. Right, and the original and Star Wars space movies before that before star wars were not really anything i mean they were well i mean there was i mean there was you know you there was the evolution was really i mean there were the you know the movies in the 1950s that were exploitation movies flying saucers stuff like that like like um based on our 
paranoia and the Cold War that was right. happening. Movies like Day the Earth Stood Still, the first real serious science fiction movie. Um, I'd say Day the, Day the Earth Stood Still was one uh, directed by Robert Wise, but uh, but twenty uh, but two thousand one Space Odyssey, which is one of my all time favorite movies by Stanley Kubrick. That movie, <clears throat> seeing that movie blew me away as a kid. Can I tell you a quick story? Yeah, go for it. Can you tell a quick story on this podcast. Um, I when I was a little kid hated movies. I'm talking about single digit age, little me, what just hated movie. I was like three or four years old. I thought movies were stupid and dumb. Now I'm watching movies on television, movies like West Side Story and Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz. These are movies that were annual family events. The Ten Commandments, you gather around the TV, you all watch movies. The thing that bothered me as a three or four year old was that no one ever went to the bathroom in a movie. (laughs) <laughs> that meant it wasn't real <laughs> movies aren't real they're fake they never go to the bathroom in these movies how can it be real when does dorothy go to the bathroom you know so I, it, it used to frustrate me and i remember like giving impassioned speeches to my family about how movies were stupid because when did they go to the bathroom because when you're that uh, you know little your your concerns are tactile concern tactile concerns i need to go to the bathroom i've got to eat i need to sleep right. i need to take this shitty diaper off you know things like the simple things someone it's has the to fart things. at some point in their life right you know? yeah. right the fact that it just didn't include human you know things that that i was experiencing made me think it was bullshit so my dad took me to a retrospective screening of 2001 a space odyssey at the age of five years old and you know how intense that movie is. Right. And the thing that blew me away is there's a scene where, uh, where you know, the doctor is taking the shuttle, right, to the moon. Right. And he goes and he has to go to the bathroom. And he's reading the instructions for how to go to the bathroom, which actually Stanley Kubrick in his genius, actually those are real instructions about how to go to the bathroom in space. And that scared the crap out of me. Because it told me that the movie was re- that the movie was real. Right. The things that were happening in the movie were real because people acted like people do in real life, which right. is they go to the bathroom and they eat. Because eating is a big thing in two thousand and one. The astronauts, right? You see Dr. Floyd drinking, eating is a thing, and going to the bathroom. So he includes those. And then if you look, um, I kept track of this. Uh, later because I have all sorts of weird obsessions, but um, Stanley Kubrick also put going to the bathroom scenes in other films of his. There's a scene in eyes wide shut where Nicole Kidman sits down in the bathroom and tinkles right. while she's having a conversation with her husband, which is a very human thing that couples do. I can attest to that. I have had a woman tinkle in front of me when you're having a conversation. It's a simple human thing that when you're in an intimate relationship, that that's a, a thing that's acceptable to do, right. but more than any other actor. And so I kept, track of like movies where characters went to the bathroom i will shock you maybe for a second it might shock you to learn the the one actor that has gone to the bathroom the most in his films more than any other actor is care to take a guess no i uh, nicholas cage rod sterling no but this person is an oscar winner tom hanks it is tom hanks he has gone to the bathroom you guessed it alan it's Tom Hanks has gone to the bathroom more in movies than any other actor. It was a plot point in The Green Mile. In Castaway, he goes to the bathroom on the plane. He he lives in the bathroom in that one movie where he lived in the The terminal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so if you if you look at his movies, he he says in Forrest Gump, I gotta pee. So he acknowledges. So if you want to get Tom Hanks to be in your movie, right. write a scene where he has to go to the bathroom. And uh, it'll appeal, it might, it may appeal to him, but there are, what I found, which is really funny because of course, this is something that, that has just sort of, you know, kept my interest because I, I, I love big budget blockbuster Hollywood movies when they're done well, as much as I love independent films. Right. right? But um, what I didn't realize is people keep track of this stuff. There are actually websites dedicated to scenes in movies where people go to the bathroom. Now I'm not obsessed with this from a standpoint of any sort of weird sexual fetish. Um, it just has to do with, I think that it humanizes characters in movies. So I love scenes where people do that. Well, I thought the same thing. My wife and I, when we used to watch that ABC show, uh, extreme makeover where they build houses, right? We noticed that 
at the beginning, they used to cut to maybe a scene of a remodeled bathroom. Mm -hmm. We'd see a toilet, and then we never saw it again. And we used to exclaim, like, is there a bathroom in this new remodeled house? <laughs> I mean, joking, but you bring up a great point. It's it's life. It's reality. But it's it's that, ooh, I don't want to talk about pee-pee poo-poo. Right. Well, it's like that one piece of screenwriter <clears throat> advice, you know, save the cat. It's a way that you, you know, if you show a character in a movie saving an animal, it, it, it humanizes that person and it makes you immediately like them. Like Ray saved little BB-8 in Star Wars The Force Awakens, which is, of course, the best fan film ever made. And just so you know, I, I uh, all of my cats are rescues. Anyway, go on, Chris. Back to <laughs> yes, you. yes, exactly. But no, but it's a thing. And I think that also doing things like showing characters eating you know, um, showing characters going to the bathroom, it humanizes them because these are all things that universally we all do, you know, no matter, you know, what culture, what nation, it's, you know, we all do these human things. Right. So I, I, I find it um, fascinating when those types of things are included. Right. Now, I will say that I do enjoy still as an adult male hearing fart sounds. So, you know, <laughs> Seth MacFarlane doing Family Guy. You would like, okay, well, then you would like, and I'm not saying this as a plug because it actually organically fits <laughs> in the conversation, but I, I don't know if you know, I co-wrote and produced this film called My Big Fat Independent Movie, which is a feature-length spoof, spoof comedy starring Paget Brewster. Uh, Bob Odenkirk is in it. He plays this guy who lives in the trunk of the two hitmen. <laughs> so we, um, yeah, a, a lot of comedians that you probably know are in it. And it's basically a parody of, um, you know, the heyday of indie film in the 90s. Right. And there is a pooping and farting scene in it. So I, I could add my own movie to the list <laughs> of movies where people have gone to the bathroom. So, um, Great. you would, I'm, you would love it. I'm sure, I'm sure it's on, uh, I'm sure it's on Netflix. I need to remind the audience that I rescued three cats. All right. <laughs> now, Naked Gun had a great bathroom scene. Oh my God. Uh, and right. then Blazing Saddles, of course. Well, yeah. Blazing scene. Saddles, now, the farting scene around the campfire. Now, is I gotta brilliant. say, to sit with an audience of people <laughs> watching, well, the, the whole movie, but yeah. watching that scene was like uh, pure see, joy. It's like, you know, it's like, See, my experience was worse. Bla the, the only time I saw Blazing Saddles was on television, oh. and they would not give you the audio of the farting scene. So when the campfire what? scene happened, they bleeped it. No, no, they Did didn't they bleep it. The there was just out? no, uh, yeah, drop the sound. So I saw this movie how many times? Like dozen times. I never knew what was happening in that scene. Oh my god! Well, I didn't know Jennifer Jason Lee was nude in uh, uh, what's that movie? Was Fast Times? Fast Times, times because I only saw the, the movie one hour on TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, um, Phoebe Cates is really the well, better. Well, yeah, that's true. Event. That's true. I did. Well, actually, here's a funny thing. You talk about that movie. <clears throat> I was I was recently in a documentary um, speaking on behalf of like um, film, a documentary called Sticky. It's about masturbation, and they interviewed Jocelyn Elders, who was. Um, Surgeon General under Clinton, who actually suggested that kids learn in a healthy way that masturbation is just a part of life and suggested maybe we should teach masturbation in schools, which got her, of course, Clinton got in trouble for it. And right. he had to eventually get rid of her, which is unfortunate. But they interviewed myself, pre uh, uh, preachers, you know, just lots of people about just masturbation. It's funny because every incidence <clears throat> of masturbation in film is portrayed in a in a perverse way. Right. Like in American Beauty, when Kevin Spacey's character is masturbating, Judge Reinhold in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Um and just pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, it's 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 portrayed as an aberrant act and not just something right. that's just a part of life. Right. Now so, now kind of on the same vein, you're a father. Yes. You have you and you're you have two children that are grown. And so how has and and I want to talk about more so women in film and the way they're portrayed, the way women are treated in general. How have you changed as a man since you've had a girl and before you had any kids? Like I think one of the, one of the things that changed my life more than anything was having not just a, you know, a child, but a daughter as my right. first child. Because I remember being disappointed that I found out I was going to have a daughter. Really? Initially. Because I wanted to have a son so we could talk Star Wars, so we could throw a ball in the backyard and do guy stuff. But let me tell you, when when my daughter was born, it was, you know, 
one of the few times in my life I've experienced, it's just love at first sight. I mean, I saw, I was the first person she saw and, um, my then wife, we're, we're no longer married, but she had to get a C-section. Can I just say, let me describe, um, watching a C-section and having a, watching a baby come out, coming out of. Let me make sure I take wife. this gulp of water first <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, and, and point it at Alan while yeah, you yeah, talk. Yeah, you could do the spit take over there. It's, I, I describe it as it's just like the movie Alien. In, where in the scene where John Hurt has the eight chest burster come out, except with more blood, so it's just like that. It's it's pretty gory because you can see guts and whatnot. But she, and she's covered in blood and just all this goop. I mean, it's not pretty like it is in the movies. And okay, um, let me let me let me ask real quick because the the first instinct is why the hell are you ruining my podcast? <laughs> <laughs> why am I am I but, derailing it horribly? But, but no no no. Uh, but, no but what I'm in saying a way, is, what I'm, yeah. What I'm saying is is just like she opened her my eyes, looked at me, I burst into tears. I mean, I burst right. into tears. This little tiny thing looking at me and bur- and just is alive and looking around and seeing light and things for the first time. Um. And I held, I was the first person to hold her. I, she looked at me. It was, it was just like, it's one of those things that you can't, I used to have this photographic memory Mm -hmm. for details about movies and stupid pop culture and things that didn't matter. Um, ultimately in the larger scheme of life. But after my daughter was born, they say that what it does with certain people, it reformats your brain like a hard drive where you take a certain amount of hard drive space in your brain is now used just to always think about those kids always all the time. And my memory is not as good now. It's not wow. as good as when I was younger. And I had, mm. I had my daughter when I was in my, in my mid twenties. So I was, I was a young dad. Right. But, um, I mean, she is the world to me. She, um, she actually did illustrations. I, I put out this comedy book and album, you know, about cue the ding song sound. Um, uh, but I put out this comedy book and album. My daughter did all the paintings for it. Celebrities poop, right? Which is like a parody of the book. Everyone poops by Taro Gomi. Right. It's one of the best selling children's books of all time. So I did a page for page parody of that book of celebrities pooping. Like the opening page is Oprah takes a big poop. Justin Bieber takes a small poop. <laughs> I've get, have I given you a copy of yes, my book? Yes, I, yeah, okay. I have. Yeah, yeah. Got it. I, hopefully it's in your bathroom. Right. Did, but she did all the paintings in it. But like my daughter, we just have such a close relationship. And I just, here's what I love also. Like I, like, uh, I mean, I was, this, this is going to sound like a weird thing to say, but <clears throat> I was raised by women. So I say this in a way that some, some might say, a person might say, I was raised by wolves. I was <laughs> raised by very strong women. My mother was, um, single mom, you know, when I was nine mm-hmm. years old, my father left and, you know, my mom had to figure out how to raise us. And, you know, without a dad around, you know, at the time maybe wasn't as common as it is now. Um, I had a strong, my grandmother, very strong personality. Um, and I had two aunts. Um, who were very important to me, very, um, in my life, just very influential. So, and just watching what my mother had to go through to struggle and change her career from being a stay at home mom to being a salesperson and becoming successful in her own right. And so I've always been like very, you know, I've, I, I don't know that I would a hundred percent describe myself as a feminist then, but after my daughter was born, absolutely. And I remember a part of me being kind of angry. Like at the time, okay, my daughter was born in 92. So I remember being like angry, like f- women get the, the short end of the stick. They're, they don't, they're not paid as much. That's bullshit. They're not like, like I was angry. She's not going to have as many opportunities. She's not going to, you know, I was like angry. Like, how, like I'll give you a really, I'll tell you a really weird story that'll tell you something about me is my daughter is like, we had these bushes that were, were at the this house we were renting in Pasadena. My daughter <clears throat> would come around in these this one bush. She would catch herself on it and like hurt herself. And one time she caught herself and fell on the cement for this one bush that wasn't trimmed. And I went over. I was so mad. I punched the bush. I just literally punched the bush. I was so angry and just pulled it apart so that it would not harm my daughter. So, um, yeah, you- I'm, I'm, I, 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 I <laughs> So I don't know what that says about me. Maybe I 
should. It, sound, it sounds like you're I a protective yard work. It and sounds be less like you're angry. a protective father. You, protective you, that you father, love yes. your, you. You would punch whatever was the cause of your daughter getting yeah. hurt. It's my only fear is anything happening to my children. It's like I don't fear like whatever. I don't fear like anything happening to my kids. It's just like that is the only thing that like that's a nightmare. So like, what do you think of those it. movies? Taken and Taken Two, Taken Three. Oh, why do you think they're so popular? Because every I mean like that's that's like that's, that's like the ultimate that's like movie. that's like old guy porn is all the Taken <laughs> movies because it's like yeah Liam Neeson sixty and he's a white dude and he's going after the bad other you know like it's 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 a very yeah, simple but shit thing. keeps happening to him kind of like you know I know all the like, die. He's movies, a really like, shitty dad. He's, he's, he's <laughs> well, terrible. Well, are you saying that Bruce Willis is a shitty cop because he, he keeps... is a terrible cop? He's getting into <laughs> but he solves it in the end. But but no, like just like there's there's a bond that formed right. instantly with my daughter that that also like and but how no what I love is how things have changed. We now are very close to depends on when you're listening to this podcast having a female our first female president. You know right. that like. Although I, I I would prefer Elizabeth Warren. I think that she's just way more dead on when it comes to the issues. Right. She's more of a female Bernie. Right. Um, but but um, things have changed dramatically. I think that the sort of self-community policing that has occurred online with regard to how women are treated, um, the 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 bullying and that the sort of the jockocracy because I was always a nerd like growing up so I was right. always the victim of the jockocracy so fuck that like all my right. friends were you know everyone who was ostracized everyone who was a nerd everyone who was like that was my my group were like the outcasts you know in high school and right and college and did whatnot. you I, so, I'm curious did you ever bring your daughter up with the nerdy things that you enjoyed because you said when when she I, was born, you were afraid you were not going to be able to do it. Here's any what's of that. weird. I didn't have to. What was weird is through osmosis, you just find that if you're, a, you know, you're, you, you're influencing your kids in every way, in everything that you do, no matter what. You're, you're influencing children when you're around them, the way you act, the way you, the way you do anything, they're going to, imitate it in some form through osmosis i don't know but like she's a girl so everybody got her girl things right so it's like here she is she's this young kid she's getting like barbies and this and she hated barbie she was into godzilla <laughs> she loved the, the the matthew broderick godzilla movie came out around the time um that she was like right around the right age she right. was into it she had these this pair of Godzilla pajamas that she wore almost constantly. And she started collecting like the Toho accurate, like figures that I would get. She sort of saw them on my shelf and she wanted them. And like, it was sort of like the thing where it's just like, when you see those collectors are like, it's, it's mint in box. It's like, if my kids wanted anything that I had, I don't care. I'm going to, right. All that stuff went out the window. It was just not important. So she started know? opening all your, all your boxes. And well, I, I had to give it to her. And, yeah. yeah, but yeah, That's exactly like, what's happening with my daughter. Yeah, no, if she likes it, like I want her to, I want her to be influenced mm -hmm. by that stuff. I mean, it's weird. Like, just like I would introduce her to things little by little and she loved. And then it's like, as she got older, we would watch Metalocalypse together, like weird stuff. So I don't know. Like right. my daughter is like, my, my kids are my heroes. You know, like I want, I want them to uh, be smarter and uh, better than me. And, and, um, I, I I know that they're better people. They're not assholes. I really get when it comes to parenting. Like I'm kind of I, I'm kind of militant about that. When I see like how kids in L.A. are just the the free range parenting, it's either two things: it's free range parenting or helicopter parenting, and both are bad techniques. Right. They're both techniques that don't result in raising adults. Because my one job as as a parent is to make sure my daughter can. Um, can basically uh, live her life without my help. Right. That's what they both, say. Both my the, kids. the point is to of a parent. That's too. what you should do, but that's not the way it is. And when I see like my friends, some of my friends, I'm not naming any names, in the comedy community that are less, that are in like their late 30s or 40s that are less responsible than my own kids that are in their early 20s, I'm like, dudes, dudes, <laughs> get it together. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you've always had a uh, strong affinity for women and matriarchy i guess is, is that the right word matriarch strong strong, sure, strong sure, matriarch yeah. i think um so one of your list items was you said all women all the women i have loved have been exceptional i am grateful to them for all making me a man now you're not currently married so you've i'm assuming you've been dating off and on since no but i th the thing is i have been fortunate i've had 
four serious relationships in 25 years. One I was married to, one uh, was sort of a rebound from the marriage, and then two relationships after that. I just, I just am now beginning. I'm in the beginning stages of looks like girlfriend could be girl. This is the first like I've been. You're my smitten. last, my last girlfriend. I, we broke up in 2012, and uh, it was on and off for a disastrously long time. But, but no, there's a girl I'm seeing now that's like yeah. exceptional. I mean, there's right. like. So so I have been fortunate all of the women including the most recent girlfriend have been just exceptional people. I've been like, you know, my I like to think that my wife like she made me a man. Mm-hmm. She like when we would get into conflicts it's like, you know, cuz I'm not a fan of like traditional gender roles splitting like chores. Right. Like the guys should do this and then the girl should do that. I think that's stupid. I just think that that's that's moronic. It's um, so it's I, okay for a man to clean the cat box. Here's what you're saying. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you should feel pr- yeah, yeah. No, but like, look, it just just be even division if possible. It's never going to be a hundred percent. But also, like, look, you know, it's it's funny because I have dated girls where I've made them breakfast in the morning, mm-hmm. and it was as if I performed a magic trick. Because people don't come preloaded with skills. It's like, look, I can cook because I have skills. My right. place is neat and clean and organized because I'm an adult man. Now, it doesn't mean I've not got, you know, as you do, all kinds of cool ephemera and pop culture stuff. Like, of course I have that stuff. That's my, I'm into right. Batman and Star Wars and. But you don't live like stuff. you're living in a dorm with whitey tidy sitting on yes. the floor. Yeah. I don't have milk crates with all my stuff stacked up to make <laughs> shelves, you know, like, so, um, yeah, so, so I just think that there's been a, a, a sort of lack of skills being taught when you see like people like being, br- I sound like a curmudgeon old man now, but like, but yeah, but like, it just, it disappoints me that it's like, come on, these are like basic skills. Learn to cook, learn to sew on a button on your shirt, <clears throat> learn to do like really simple stuff and learn right. to do, learn to fix things in your house. I mean, I owned a house at one point and one thing you'll discover when you own a home is everything costs $600. <laughs> This right. costs six. So I wanted to learn. And thankfully with YouTube now, number one category on YouTube is how to's. Right. It's not cat videos. But did you learn this? Sorry, cat. <laughs> did you, um, did you learn this to impress women? I wasn't trying. No, I was trying to save money on the house. And I was trying to like, just practically like, I want it. Look, I want to make breakfast. I, you right. know, I want to make, be able to make breakfast for my children. These but it like also makes things. you probably makes you feel like a man, like, Hey, you know what? I'm doing good in this world. I'm contributing this. And somebody's appreciating this rather than. I'm assuming there's uh, that there's that. Well, yeah, I mean, like that's why I like really appreciate like my. Uh, I, I even hate to use the term ex-wife because I think it's a derogatory term. I think that I I would I would use the term she's my previous she's my previous serious relationship mm-hmm. using the word previous as a noun. Um, so because because I think ex-wife my ex ex comes with a derogatory right. You know, it's not thing. normally taken as a positive right. thing. It's kind of but like it, casting aside versus. Yes, it's a, it's a, uh, and I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. You know, we really grew apart, and and that's just what happened. You know, so, um, but I do think that there's a t- like if I'm gonna choose to, you know, be in a relationship with a woman, it's because she has special qualities that go beyond. You know, uh, I think looks is prized way too highly in 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 this town especially in hollywood right in hollywood in the entertainment industry but um you know i've just been fortunate that i feel i've i've learned uh a great deal from the women i've i've been with i have a great deal of respect for um all of those women that have tolerated me you know in my leveling up because <laughs> You know, I, I feel like I'm always trying to improve myself. I mean, like, if you look at my book collection, it's like nerdy stuff and self help books and books, but like, not just self help, like learning new things and business wonky books. Right. And, you know, I want to learn new stuff because I am a, you know, I'm a guy that, um, I mean, I'm a college dropout, right? So I dropped out of college when I was 19 because my parents were debating about who was going to 
pay for college. And I just said, look, guys, I'm working three jobs and trying to go to school. So I dropped out of college and I bought a book about how to publish a magazine. And then I started a magazine. And then ironically, years later, I wrote a book called The Ultimate Film Festival Survival Guide, which is required reading at some schools. What I'll came- get into more detail about that later, but but the but the wi- but <clears throat> women you asked about women, right? And, and I've just been really fortunate, you know. Does your daughter give you advice? Because she's old, she's an, a young adult now. So does she give you advice that surprises you? Because you were once her. Yeah, her I mean, age. she's incredibly, she's an incredibly talented artist. She skipped a grade when she went to high school. They put her in the tenth grade when she started as a freshman because she was so skilled as an artist and I'm sure she got it from her mother because her mother's an artist as well. But I want to be with someone I I learn something from. Mm-hmm. So all the women, my ex, my previous, right. my, my three relationships since have all been women where I learned a great deal being with them, whether it was, you know, how, how to, how to cook certain how to poach eggs correctly mm-hmm. or, you know, um, having a good sense of humor or, you know, how to love, how to really love, um, how to be a man like those, all those things. And look, I'm still in development. All right. I I'm think we all, I think that's why we're on this planet is we're, right. we're learning something, one or yeah, more I, things. Do you make yeah. a distinction between your development as a person versus your development as a man, especially from the influences of the women in your life? Um, not necessarily. I mean, like, you know, I, I, those, those things are, we, we have crazy cat stuff happening. Yeah, <laughs> there is crazy cat stuff happening. Can we run a, a wireless Kling headquarters? Okay. Let's run wireless nine over there to get it. A- <laughs> but, um, no, I, 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 I don't know. I don't. And also I think that that stuff has just been, I think that's kind of mm-hmm. dumb. I think, <clears throat> yeah, look, men and women should both know how to change a tire. So you're not stranded on the road. Right. Because something bad could happen. And that is that is something where in the wrong circumstance, you can die from not learning how to change a tire. Mm -hmm. Right. So these are simple things that that every it's how I felt when I got out of high school. I felt like, wow, I know all this stuff. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Mm. I don't know. And I was always trying to take classes that were practical. I took in high school. I took sewing classes, typing classes, cooking classes, because I wanted these skills. Right. Right. And then I wanted to better those skills. I think that that's just. I'm sure MacGyver did that, too. I'm sure MacGyver (laughs) did it as well. But I mean, luckily, we've got the Internet where you can just, you know, ask Siri how to do something or where something is. And it's. And it's pretty awesome, you know. Right. And I think that those 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 gender classifications of jobs are are little by little going away. Although it is different living here, <clears throat> living on in, on the West Coast. And if you live, you know, somewhere in the Midwest, which is where I grew up, I think the Midwest is um, a, a good friend who taught animation um, in the it, it, in in Detroit told me. She said, um, aside from the racism, sexism, homophobia, and rampant culturally ingrained low self-esteem, she loved the Midwest. <laughs> so, but it is, it's weird when you go back there, it is sort of like, it's still not, we think, you know, that oh, everybody's evolved now and this is the way. Nope. Yeah. It's not that way. And it's worse in other parts of the world. And it's become sure. very apparent, especially with Obama. With a black man as our oh, president, he is he has tre- been treated the worst of any president in in history. He has been so disrespected. Just the way he's spoken about the 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 obstructionist, you know, the the the, the rest- obstructionist Republicans that just won't even make some sort of deals. Right. And, and, you know, it used to be, you know, I remember Reagan would, you know, he, he was a good guy, actually, yeah. to the Democrats. He tried to work with Democrats and do, he was charming. Right. And I think Obama's charming. He's like, since I've been alive, he's my favorite president. Okay. So you talked a lot about the women, the strong women, and that you were brought up by your woman. So was there a father? Did you, you had a dad? Did oh yeah, no, no. My my dad, my dad was great. I mean, you know, um, divorce was very. Com- it was like it's like it I, basically spread in the seventies. Yeah, which oh is yeah. When my parents got divorced, that was a thing where divorce was not a thing in the sixties. It was that was a hush hush thing that didn't happen often. But in the seventies, it just became something that was more common. Yeah. Uh, but no, my dad was a very big part of my life. My dad was uh, um, a 
singer in a barbershop quartet and he was wow he was famous like in that arena like um in fact an article recently came out in spebsqua which is uh all, all it's the society for the preservation and advancement of of barbershop quartet singing in america <laughs> i'm sure i said that wrong but um it was you know he was named one of the top 10 leads of all time in barbershop so he's very you know like I would see my dad sing to auditoriums of like 10,000 people wow. when I was a little kid. And he really, he taught me a lot, like just about like, just, you know, he was incredibly gracious and happy for all the fans that he had. And he, he was selling LPs and cassettes and, and eight tracks and later, you know, CDs at shows. And he, you know, that he would travel and do barbershop shows. So wow, that's amazing. On, on weekends, you know, that was like his thing. He worked a normal job in the auto industry in the computer department um, when I was growing up. And then on weekends, he was a singer in a barbershop quartet and really was just incredibly gracious to his fans. Wow. And then so that so, leads us to one of the things that changed your life. You wrote watching Star Trek with my dad in the 1970s. Led oh, yeah. to an interest in space exploration, science, and all things Trek. I have a vivid memory of my father in, this is in the late 60s, uh, when we landed on the moon. He was screaming at the television, we landed on the moon, we landed on the moon, pointing, I mean, I'm three, you know, right. three, four years old. And he's pointing to the TV like, oh my God, we landed on the moon. And my dad was obsessed with science. And he studied in the 1960s computers. Which computers then were like this apartment. Like, right. You know, they were huge. They were rooms. You would have a room of computers doing calculations. And one of the things that was interesting was he would come home from work with these box of punch cards, which is how they fed data into the computer, right? right. And they were just used punch cards, so they would throw them away. He'd give them to me, and I would just color on them. And we would watch, my father and I would, would watch Star Trek together. And Star Trek, I mean, Star Trek was a thing that like, you know, and when it, it just it really affected me because it was also, I, I feel like at least then, I feel like it's not as much of a problem now, but men in general have difficulty discussing feelings. Oh, this yeah. is why I feel that sports are so popular because it's the way men can talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Men can talk to each other by bonding over sports because right. sports is... It's manly and we can talk about that, but ask like, you know, an adult man to talk to his adult son. Right. That's not as easy a conversation to be had, but you can talk about, you know, who's going to the Super Bowl and all this. So it's a way that guys, I think, relate to each other. So right. my father and I bonded over Star Trek because it was a way to talk about morality, talk about, you know, moral choices, you know, the prime directive. Um, you know, um, right and wrong, uh, girls, you know, right. But Captain Kirk was c quite the womanizer. Right. And it's time. amazing how many things, subtle things in order to get through the, uh, I guess the network, uh, censors at the time. Oh, with the to first interracial kiss on television was in Star Trek. Right. The only reason the network allowed it to happen is because Captain Kirk was forced to kiss Uhura by these aliens that use their powers. But Gene Roddenberry, when you read about his life, he fought for so many oh, things. Oh, yeah. The other thing a lot of people don't know about Star Trek is people look on the miniskirts at the time at, that they wore in the uniforms as being sexist. How, how dare they? Why? And originally, in the original pilot episode, the women on the show wore pants. If you look at the original pilot for the Star Trek series, the one without... Um, with William Christopher Shatner, Pike as the Christopher Pike. Yeah. the women had pants and the second in command number one was a woman right? right that's right okay so she wore pants the women on the show because you need to know the context the time the period of time mini skirts were at the time a considered um, a symbol of liberation it was women saying these are our bodies we can do what we want with them we're wearing mini skirts screw you trying to make us be a certain way mini skirts were a sign of women rebelling against you know the establishment so all the women on the show on the star trek show were like we're wearing these mini skirts this we're making a statement by this right. but now in today's you know hyper being upset about everything culture you know um 
people and, look on it as like that's a sexist thing when it was actually a symbol of 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 you know, giving a middle finger to the establishment. Right. So not and, only and Gene Roddenberry supported that. He right. supported it was such a groundbreaking show. And see that's the thing is like Star Trek I think had probably more of an influence on me than Star Wars because Star Wars was a surprise. No one knew Star Wars was going to happen. Right. I was going to ask you did you did you have any expectations or was no, it you I know it was a spa- it was an adventure. That it was in like space. it's in outer space and the wolf man's in it. <laughs> But it, but it was also groundbreaking and groundbreaking in on every level. But you didn't but know until you it. saw it. We didn't know until we saw it. Whereas Star Trek, I had read about the Star Trek movie. There was going to be a Star Trek TV series called Star right. Trek Phase Two, which ended up not happening. And they right. used the development of that to make the Star Trek Star the, Trek the motion picture was going. The, the to, cartoon did the cartoon <clears throat> come out in the, the cartoon 70s? was in the seventies, and I watched the cartoon with my dad. Like yeah. we, Star Trek was something we watched together because it was a it was a way to get in. To talk about things. Yeah. But if you like, to me, sports, see, I think sports is incredibly homoerotic. I think, I think watching the sport, this is why I feel like, which is why I find it so funny that like men being guys and the whole jockocracy and them being into sports, it's like, it's kind of homoerotic sports. I mean, I, I have a, I have a Twitter account. I have a lot of Twitter accounts. <laughs> One of my Twitter accounts is called sports or sex. All I do is I quote what sports announcers say. All language related to sports sounds like they're announcing gay porn. <laughs> it's like, he got full penetration right up the middle. There are about 10 guys in there. And they, they, I mean, you know, in football, they wear tights. I mean, they wear the right. same things that, you, you know. Why do you make fun of sports? Is it a defense mechanism? It's a defense mechanism because, because you know, I was – a, a bullied and abused by dudes that were into sports. I was by, by, that, by the jockocracy in Michigan. Um, when, when I was a kid, I just was wanted to be into nerdy stuff, nerdy, but I had a sense of humor and I was funny. Um, yeah. and it, I think I was, I think when people remember me, they, I mean, that's like, you know, my Twitter name is that Chris Gore, but I'm telling you, I was called that Chris Gore since I was in elementary school. Wow. So I was, oh, that Chris Gore, you know, de- in a derisive way, like, you know, because it's like I was the jokester. I was always right. trying to do something goofy. Right. I, when I get in contact with somebody from childhood, elementary school or high school on Facebook. They must and, remember that you were funny. That, and that blows me away. Like I, it's hard for me to respond because I am blown away because I felt like such a nobody in school that I was like, I couldn't have been funny because I didn't even know I was funny until, until I was in my twenties and I did the best man speech for my brother's wedding. And that was the first time it was not just my mom or my grandmother saying, Oh, Lauren, you're so funny. It was a room full of other people. And that was the, and so before then, I didn't think I was funny, but other people said I was always funny. You are naturally funny. Like, just like, I feel like if I saw you doing stand up and you just got up on stage and you're just you, I would start laughing before you talked, you know? It's funny you mentioned that because my mom just gave me a whole bunch of pictures from my childhood. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the first thing I think of is, oh, don't you love me anymore? <laughs> don't you want to keep some of these? She's like, no, I have them. <laughs> <laughs> what does that tell you? <laughs> uh, that she's preparing me to clean up her house when she goes. Yeah. We had that conversation. That oh, wow. We That's going to be difficult. Um, it's not. It was interesting. I talked to my mom and she said, you know, it's, it's life. We, we're born, we live, and we die. And, you know, she said, it, it's weird because, you know, my mom is a funny woman, so we can joke about it. And, and yet it's a matter of fact thing. It's like, what are you going to do? Why feel horrible talking about something that will, will eventually happen? So, but the, you know, the conversation is, what am I going to do with those pair of K2 skis from the 1970s that are still in my parents garage and that's one of two billion different objects so do you use like your best material when you're like talking to your mom about her 
she's she's do you do you joke with her about stuff like that like my best material is right now <laughs> <laughs> no but like you, you must joke with her she's oh got, yeah, yeah 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 i i got my i definitely got my humor from her and my want of talking to strangers much to the chagrin of my wife who <laughs> is embarrassing to make sense. I love that. I'm the same way. That's I got that from my grandmother and my mother, like just would talk to strangers in grocery lines and just be friendly to whoever. Yeah. And it's just, um, I mean, it's certainly an easier way to go about life. It just, you, it is. Yeah. I do find it more difficult to talk to guys. Yeah. That's, it's yeah. a weird Men tend thing. to be more standoffish and, and I feel, you know. yeah, it's, it's almost like I feel a lot more comfortable talking to women. Um, but that brings us to, uh, another topic. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the death of your father. Yeah. And we're at that age where it's not just our grandparents or distant people when we're young and we don't understand. I mean, I, I lost my stepmother, the youngest of my parents, you know, step and real parents. Mm -hmm. So talk about the death of your father. Yeah. No, well, it was a long time coming, but you never think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, he was in, he was in poor health for like the last seven years of his life. He was battling this ailment or that thing. I never believed because he was always like, you know, my tough dad. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, it was, it was Christmas Eve, 2012. Um, wow. Where he called me and he, I didn't realize it at the time, but he was saying goodbye, but I didn't know. But he was wishing me Merry Christmas and he was – but it felt weird. It felt like he was saying a goodbye. It felt like, okay, it was like, all right. And like, you know, um, it just felt strange and it's Merry Christmas and yeah. And then that was the last time I spoke to him because I got a call from his wife. He was remarried mm -hmm. and – she told me, you know, that, that they got to put him in hospice, like that he's and to hurry. And I've never been in this position. So here I am. I'm sitting here in this new apartment, new place I just moved into. And I'm having to get, and I was like, I remember feeling lightheaded when I got this call, not knowing what to do and feeling like I got to drop everything and just go. Mm -hmm. I just have to go. Right. And, um, I actually talked to our mutual friend, Mary. Right. And she was like, get, just get on a plane. Just get, she was like texting me or emailing me. Like, here's some options, flight options. Just go figure it out, blah, blah, blah. I packed sort of basics and left and went to LAX, got, and by the time I got there though, he had, he was already under the morphine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I just, I remember, you know, seeing him there. The one thing that was interesting strange was that he could hear me and understand me and communicate by squeezing my hand, mm -hmm. but not, he couldn't speak. He was out. But, um, have you ever had that experience where I imagine this like being asleep, but like, you know, you still kind of are aware that there's like stuff happening around you and imagine that, but you can't actually wake up. Yeah. So, um, I guess it really bothered me that my dad had an awareness that he was going to die, that this was just preparing him for that. You know, just the going under was just to make it be painless. Right. And I was with him all weekend and, uh, you know, uh, I just slept in a chair. Like I didn't go, I actually didn't go anywhere. Like, so I got there like Friday night and then like, it was Saturday morning and I was just there through Sunday night. He died late Sunday night, but we had a Detroit lions game on. And so we kind of like watched the lions game. Um, Cause that was one of the things my dad and I would do together is like whenever, whatever the result of the Detroit lions, like uh, we would just talk to each other about that. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, no, he, he, it, it was just like difficult to watch him. Like, because I think of him as being like tough and virile and here he was just like, um, just so fragile. Right. And, uh, watching him kind of waste away, like, you know, and then struggle to breathe to the point where, you know, I hate to even bring, but it looked like he looked like kind of like, uh, like when you see some of the zombies on Walking Dead, the sort of the, the, their, the, the sort of look on their, the, the, right. the, the scream look. 
right. on their face, the the mouth on the and the he was starting to like like just because he was so struggling to breathe. It was like all of whatever effort, it just got less and less and less to nothing. It was very slow. It is weird being a lifelong film fan and then comparing, you know, personal experiences from your life to movies. This is something I think I've done since I was young, but right. You know, um, it's something I don't think I'll ever be able to stop doing, unfortunately, but, but I mean, it's, but, it, but um, you know, I mean, I, I know like the one thing I do feel good is we never ended any con. We never ended any conversation without saying, I love you. Yeah. Um, and I didn't do that necessarily all the time until like my girlfriend after my marriage, I had this girlfriend who she was an orphan and lost her parent, both of her parents when she was very young and never ended any exchange with us without saying, I love you and hugging anything. Wow. Phone call, text exchange, email, always never not said, I love you. So just, you know, that informed how to me, how important that was. And her experience, the way she lost her parents was horrible. My dad was not that. I mean, my dad was, he was, he was the type of person who, I mean, he would sing this. He had a couple like songs that he would sing. Everyone cried when, when like he, I mean, the emotion that was in these songs that he would sing in, in barbershop. Like I would see you're in a room with thousands of people and they're all crying because my dad singing this, this love song is intense. I mean, that's how, you know, well, that's I how think- he met, that's how he met his new wife was, you know, singing a song and she fell in love with him from that song. Right. I, I I've always loved barbershop singers partly because growing you know growing up close enough to disneyland to go wow uh so i you know i wow, so yeah the barbershop singers at, at disneyland yeah no he was in his, his the the quartet he was in that he's most famous for is the vagabonds because they got very close to getting a gold medal but he never won a gold medal it was like this thing that plagued him throughout his adult life was not winning that gold medal medal but getting close then he was in another group called center stage another group called marquee but yeah his um he was like a hero like it was weird like it was interesting because i've had a little brush with fame myself just from you know having done television that i've done and um But I got to see my dad and how he dealt with being famous in a group. I'm sort of famous in a group of like nerds. If I go to a convention like WonderCon, it's like a little bit of fame or like maybe to a film festival. But I'm not, I'm not famous in real terms. But like my dad was kind of like that. So I would see like just how gracious he was to everyone and would talk to everybody and be like just, and I know I learned that from my dad and that I, I believe that helped me later in life just to just you know just be nice to everybody and then things are uh, things go easy that way right right but, yeah in- interesting um and so that leads us into the next topic uh doing tv professionally for the very first time and learning everything on the job so was that your first foray into well, writing I, something thing, or creative yeah Did you do- i never had any aspirations to do television so and I mean, I had a TV career for like 15 years and I'll still do stuff every once in a Mm -hmm. while, but I don't enjoy it as much as producing or writing and sort of controlling my own content. Right. Um, But um, yeah, no, I I was writing, I was doing, I was writing a book and taking care. I was a stay at home dad, basically Stay, stay at home, dad, taking care of my kids and writing two books at the same time, which I don't recommend that you ever do. (laughs) Terrible. Um, But um I got called because some guy, it was a guy named Mark Cronin, who used to do the old Howard Stern show, um, the Channel 9 show that Howard yeah, Stern yeah. did. Mark Cronin famously did all this reality TV that he made a fortune. You know, um, you can look up Mark Cronin. That guy right. is, he's a multimillionaire from doing, doing stuff. But he was like, they were looking, he thought that stuff that I wrote in Film Threat was funny that these reviews were weird and funny. So he brought me in to do an audition. And I remember being feeling very inconvenienced. (laughs) Inconvenienced. Yeah. Because I'm taking care of two kids and I'm writing two books. I don't have time to go to an audition for a TV show. TV is those, those are idiots. You know, I'm not, I, I, you know, the people that are generally the TV hosts are, 
you know the kind I'm talking about, the Ryan Seacrest types. I think those people are, they don't, most people that are on television talking about things don't actually know what they're talking about. They're just well produced. Right. Right. And that would bother me. It would, that would just bother me to no end. Um, so I just didn't have any aspirations, but they brought me in for one audition. And it was a guy named Ken Crosby who brought me in um, to audition for a show called The X Show, which was – it was sort of like The Man Show, mm-hmm. but it was daily talk show format. Um, and The Man Show I was a big fan of, and we shot on the same lot as The Man Show. Right. So it was really sad. I couldn't say that I liked The Man Show at all. <laughs> and I would see Jimmy Kimmel and Adam Carolla like going to their trailer, and I'd be going to my trailer, and I was like, oh, I, can't, I can't say I like those guys, but I – Love those guys. I thought their version of the man show was great. Yeah. Um, and I, I like the work that Jimmy Kimmel did on that better than anything he's done. So present day, but, right. but just my personal opinion, but I had to learn. I, I, first of all, the thing I think that got me hired is cause I didn't care. And it's something I didn't know until later. It's just like, Oh my God, all these people are. So the stink of desperation is yeah. like a real turnoff. And I didn't realize that like, Oh, like my, not caring, like <clears throat> this is what I have said is a line for my stand up is a who gives a shit attitude is like a cologne that attracts vagina. <laughs> it's but that also applies to business, it applies to casting and auditions. Oh, if you don't care, because I don't care because I don't need it, I already had a job. I didn't right. need another job. But it's difficult for somebody passionate who who dreams of or wants to well, be I feel, something. I feel like in a way, and there's like Psychologists will even tell you studies of this, like people who want it too badly, it's actually self-defeating. Um, and like, like if they want it too badly, it's like they can't get that goal. Also, when they get that goal, their dream is done. Right. Their dream doesn't right. exist. It's almost like if it continues to, ex- the thing you want continues to exist as a dream, then it's a dream. You can continue. They're almost like in love with the struggle, but like actually right. reaching certain plateaus professionally is not something they actually want. So they're sabotaging themselves constantly. And I so, think when they finally get there, they're not as satisfied as they thought they would have been. Right, right, right. There's also another thing that they say is like, if you have a goal, like a specific like dream or goal, you shouldn't tell other people. Some people, there's two Schools of thought. One, tell lots of people because that'll commit you to doing that thing. And, other, and others, what happens is if you start telling other people about a thing you're going to do, right. it, it manifests it in real life. And then and then you're already the experience of having done it already exists because you created it in your head. So you lose interest in actually doing it. So the best thing is to pursue a goal you're not telling people. And then as things begin to come to fruition, then you can let people in your life know. I don't. I don't know how to promote this podcast or this audio series. I, I don't know. Should I not give a shit? No, you should tell people. That's a different thing. Because it's a different thing. Because you're actually doing it. You're not talking about doing a podcast. You're actually doing. But a this podcast. is really one of the first times you know? I'm actually doing, doing it because it, yeah. there's been a lot. I'm great at ideas, and Alan and I have come up with some great ideas, but. They're difficult to do, and there's and nope. so you. It's easy to give up. It's easy to be distracted. But yes. you've told me you've said do one thing, do Don't, one thing, do one thing, and then other things. Yeah, no, I and just other feel things like will happen. Other things will happen, but <clears throat> those people that have like five projects or do right. ten different things, or they're an actress slash waitress slash massage therapist. <laughs> <clears throat> I just don't think that that works. Aren't they trying to? I mean, you're really trying to try to do, you know, yeah. Jack of all trades, yeah. master of none. <laughs> I which got is it. A great show on Netflix. So master of none. Um, ding. <laughs> <laughs> I put in all these plugs. Hey, I have nothing to do with that. I have no skin in that game. That's as he's on. Sorry. It's a great show. It is a good so, show. Oh, it's so well, written. Um, I love it. And so you <clears throat> have this TV career. You kind of have a. Semi- yeah, I had to learn how to do teleprompter. Like, I didn't right, know what teleprompter. Right. It's like, oh, and then I realized literally after one time of doing it, oh, so just read it, but pretend like I'm not reading it, <laughs> pretend like I'm saying it. It's, and it was like. It's a guide. I, it's like a memory. It's yeah, like, it, was just it like, really oh. should be bullet pointed words. It should be, you know, more than. Yeah. It should be. That's. For sure. So, so it was like that was the first time I did that. And then every job led to the next job. Right. So it was like kind of like my who gives a shit thing. Like that is true. Like like I did like I went to one audition and from that every TV job I just got hired. I never had to go into other auditions. But what made you continue if it was a, get, a don't give a shit before? Here's why because it paid well. Okay. 
it allowed me to, um, you know, allowed me to do other things that I cared about more. I cared more about film threat. I cared more about writing books. And so because TV took very little time and paid well, mm -hmm. then I could do things that didn't pay as well and took more time. Got it. Okay. But like I did like after a while get a little frustrated. I did a, sh a game show for IFC. I did another show for Stars the, uh, that was like a travel show for film festivals. And I had all but like given up on doing television. I was right. just like, I don't want to do – I don't want to do TV because they try to make me into something I'm not. Like, let's do wardrobe tests. We're going to hip you up, Chris. We're going to make you hip and cool. And I'm like, I just want to be myself. So I just was like, I quit doing TV. So it was never I, a drug, though. The, no, I don't the care about that. Keep being no, I like was that. a dad. I was a dad and married and like not. I wasn't doing TV to get pussy. You know, I was like. I was doing it to make money so I could, you know, help my kids and, and, you know, be a responsible father. But, but, um, the TV job that is probably my most satisfying that I enjoyed the most mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm most known for is actually on Attack of the Show on G4 TV, right. which was called, the show was originally called The Screensavers. And I was actually on three episodes of The Screensavers. Um, but, uh, the producer of the show, uh, this guy, Gavin, who's now the producer of the Jimmy Fallon show, Gavin Purcell. Right. Um, Gavin had had me on an episode, which I didn't want to do. It was National Enquirer TV. And I was like, dude, I don't want to do National Enquirer TV. He came to my house. Please just do this segment. I did this segment. He thought I was funny. And right. he remembered me. So here it is years later. He's like, hey, I'm producing the show. You know, screensavers come in for an audition. And or not an audition. He said, come in. Let's talk about it. I, I just want to hire you to do the show. Right. And I was like, dude, I don't want to do TV anymore. I think TV is stupid. I don't, I think it's just overproduced nonsense and I don't want to do it. He goes, come in. We'll talk about it. So I came in and he said, look, we have this segment called DV Tuesday. You go on, you talk about movies and you talk about the latest DVDs. I said, that's something I do just in my spare time anyways. Right. I'll do it. He's like, okay, you're hired. We want you to do it. There wasn't an audition. Right. There wasn't like he needed tape on me. I'd already done a bunch of things. I just said, look, I have three stipulations. Okay. Right. Three. One, I want to be myself on camera. I don't want anyone telling me how to be or how to hit me up. You know, I want to be, be who I am right. on camera. I'll give you notes. Obviously, I'm not going to swear. Right. So there's limitations to what I can say, but I want my opinion to be my own and I want to be able to have my own thoughts and my own ideas and I'll come in. So basically producing the segment myself. Right. So I also want to be able to wear whatever I want because when I did this IFC show, they like tried to hit me up and do these clothes that I wouldn't actually normally wear that I didn't even feel comfortable in. Right. So I was like, I want to wear whatever I want. Right. He goes, okay, I can agree to that. I said, the other thing is, I want to keep the DVDs that I review. And he goes, <laughs> you can't keep the DVDs. <laughs> Which actually, I was kind of disappointed because I'm like, it didn't really pay that all that well at the beginning. It mm -hmm. didn't pay that much. And I was like, well, at least let me keep the DVDs. They're like, no, we can't let you keep them. We need them for the library. Which later uh -huh. I found out all the producers just stole the DVDs. Right. I mean, all the producers from Attack of the Show <laughs> yeah. were stealing DVDs. But I remember them telling me, they're like, Gavin Purcell tells me, he goes, now just so you know, I, uh, you got to keep this a secret. They're changing the name of the screensavers to Attack of the Show. And I remember like giggling going, Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to tell anybody because I thought it was the dumbest name ever. And now that show, I mean, it's kind of legendary from the standpoint it of it la launched Olivia Munn. Mm -hmm. It launched a lot of people. Like, I mean, I, I love Olivia. I think she's amazing. She's one of the hardest working people I ever worked with. Kevin Pereira is the best person I ever worked with in TV was Kevin Pereira. One of the nicest guys. He was like one of those guys that like he, his job is to make you look good. I mean, I learned from him. I mean, he's like, that's, ten, that, he's like 10 years younger than me, but like I learned how to be better on TV from watching Kevin. The guy was yeah. born to be on TV. I mean, do you think was, I'm born to be on TV? No, but the, he was born to be on TV and he, no, you have, but well, you have like your own, but see, this is the thing you have to do it. You just have to do a thing that exploits what you're good at. You have to find the thing that is your personality. Yeah. Right. Like with attack, I, because I got to be myself, it allowed me to, you know, be my, I, I, I I was better because I was able to do which that. now so today, I appreciate that. which today is kind of not a crazy idea to be yourself. At least YouTube, YouTube is all about that. It's all about that. But you're saying back then 
that was a that was a new concept like let people be themselves and like people like you know would people would you know talk trash about people like morgan webb but morgan webb was an intern who did computer stuff who they were like well you should be on camera and you know she knows she legit knows everything about video games right morgan webb right so she's on x play and she would occasionally be on attack the show so she was a legit nerd what i don't like is when they hire women in these roles that are attractive but they don't actually know what they're talking about. So they produce them to feed them stuff when, you know what, there's plenty of, if you want attractive, fine, attractive. I just think that like attraction has less to do with looks, more to do about how you feel about yourself. Cause that comes across. That's funny. That's what they said about Olivia Munn. What's that? That she was more attractive than she was. A well, legitimate. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, here's what I'll say about both. Kevin was born to be on TV. He was like born TV host who was pretending you know, when they would do these little segments, these comedy segments, he did the best he could as an actor. And even he would tell you he was not the best actor. Olivia was an actress Mm -hmm. who was amazing, who was pretending to be a TV host. So she was almost like doing, like she looked on her role as a role, her personality, that was a part she played. So, but she was brilliant and she was, I don't know. The thing is this, I know some people may have had problems with her in the past. I never did. She treated me great. And I only have amazing, you know, great things to say right. about her. What I liked she about was, her was she went for it. Whenever she went they, for it. That was they, the thing. Whatever they threw at her, she, she did it. You know what she did? She did, this is the thing, and this is like a Louis C.K. You do the shit out of it, right? That's a Louis right. C.K. thing where he talks about do do your job, do the shit out of it. And she did the shit out of that job. That's why no one could replace her who came after. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. They tried to bring in other women. They were not as, they didn't. And also, Olivia would tell the producers to fuck off. That's a stupid idea. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do my own thing. And she sometimes would succeed at that and sometimes fail. But you know what? People respected her. Mm-hmm. And those other, a lot of other talent I notice, I, I tend to notice, would be overproduced or told what to do. And, you know, yeah. I, you, you know, if you want a talking marionette or just someone to read teleprompter, you can hire any number of those people. If you want someone who knows like, what they're talking about, who can think on the fly, you yeah. know. They don't hire yeah. those people, <laughs> clearly, because right. I haven't, I haven't had a big TV job since then. But also, I haven't given a shit because the projects I'm working on are different, and you know, and and that's also something else I've realized, and, and I'm sure we've all realized, making your own content is important today. Where before you were groomed to be a talent, right? Now it's screens. Now anyone can do it, mm-hmm. and it also shows how easy. And difficult it is. I mean, right. You know, it's, but it's, it's multiple jobs right. at once. It's, it's both great and freeing, and it's difficult because you want someone to kind of say, come on board. We think you can do this. Do it. Now you have to create your own shit, like this podcast, like your books. Yeah, um, this shit. This, this shit. Podcast. Now, i Shit gonna... was created during the podcast. Yes. <laughs> so, literally, yes. Literally. The theme through our conversation uh, has been a lot about film. And one of the things that changed your life is you said you saw the movie Dune, which led to creating the magazine Film Threat. Yeah, I was a big fan of the Frank Herbert book, Dune. I I read it when I was in high school, like a freshman in high school. And that is a dense book. I mean, like, you you know, it's it's intense with like, you know, its own language and culture. And there's all this, there's like a glossary in the back of the book. And you really have to know... Uh, that book changed my life. I mean, it's just amazing what's it, you, you've got to read it. That the David Lynch movie, um, which I look back on now as sort of an admirable failure. But when I, I was dying to see that film mm-hmm. when I was a kid because I'm like, Oh my God, I love David Lynch. David Lynch is brilliant. The guy made a racer head is making Dune. The movie's going to be amazing. Like it's, you know, it was a very uncharacteristic choice to have him do it. So I was so excited. I remember telling all my friends, Dune, this movie's going to be amazing. It's going to be incredible. And I would read the book once a year, you know, wow. through, through high school. It was like one, it just had such, a, such an impact on me. And I remember just being so excited that it was coming out. My mother worked in the book business. She was a book salesperson mm. and people in the book industry were invited to an advanced screening of Dune. So my mother was able to actually get me into an advanced screening of Dune when it came out. Wow. And I remember when we went to see it, they passed out this little pamphlet 
as we sat down of like all the glossary of terms, which I already knew them all. So I was like, oh, it's cool. I'm good with it. But that movie, I hated it so much because it just betrayed everything that was in the book. And so it was like, I felt betrayed by David Lynch because I, I admired him so much as a filmmaker. Right. I felt betrayed by, you know, like this book that I grew to love through high school. And I, I was devastated by it. And so it inspired me. I wanted to do, I kind of wanted to do a punk rock fanzine. Like, How old were you at this point? I was like 18, okay. 17, 18 years old. And um, so I, I um, was so devastated by Dune sucking. Um, and, and it was a financial, it was a disaster. The movie was a f- huge failure that I wanted to, like, I wanted to write something about it. But there's nowhere to write it. Right. There's no internet. There's no posting on Facebook. There's no clicking like anything. You know, I, so there were punk, punk rock fanzines were huge. Yeah. But they were all about music. It says, well, I want to do one, but I want to make it about movies. So just the idea of film threat, it sounded like punk rock. Like minor threat, threat, like right. it sounded like a punk rock thing. So I created the logo and and created film threat so that I could write something about the movie Dune. And in the very first six page Xeroxed fanzine issue of Film Threat, I took a movie poster of Dune and I changed the words so it said dumb. <laughs> <laughs> because I was so angry. Um and I, I mean, look, I was an angry punk rock kid. Right. But um, I just sort of took all that rage and it was all, that's how Film Threat got started, was seeing the movie Dune and being, being disappointed. And then it. were you handing these out to friends? Yeah, I was still in college. I mean, I was okay. like, I was, this was like maybe my first year in college. I had like a film history class. Right. And I passed out copies of it in class and then did it as a Xerox thing. Right. And it eventually, I mean, look, film threats, a very, very long story. And that's actually a, a book. I'm working on a book and a documentary about film threat right now, but right. it's not going to be out for s- s- probably two to three years. Cause it's a long project. Right. So, but on. how did it go from this Xerox zine to an, an a full magazine? Was You'll it- have to read. I mean, it is such a long story, <laughs> but it's filled with a lot of, weird bizarre stories like the one i just told like of because eventually years later i got to meet david lynch and talk to him about dune which was really fun to go to david lynch's (laughs) house he lives up in the hollywood hills right and he's got two houses next to each other one house he lives in um and he he cooks in that house but he will not cook in the house that is his office where his studio is right so he has one that's like a workspace a house and he goes next door and that's where he lives he loves to cook did you talk to him about Dune or oh, I talked to him about Dune. I talked to him about everything. Oh, is that the reason he was a, he was originally going to be the director of Return of the Jedi? Wow! Um, and so I went to his house, and what was interesting was he had shellacked a piece of roadkill onto a canvas because he was like, "Yeah, I collect roadkill," and so it was like a dead squirrel shellacked to this painting. It was pretty intense. It's, so was this? He was doing TMI at the time, wasn't he? Because he's a big transcendental meditation Oh, yeah, yeah, guy. yeah, definitely. Yeah. But um, no, I, I still admire, like, I look on, I even told David Lynch, I said, I look on that movie as, as like, a, like, like uh, a beautiful failure. Like, it was so such a good-looking movie. I mean, right. Dune also, like, in retrospect now, it's like, it actually is kind of a cool movie, like, looking back. There's things that, it was incredibly ambitious. I think I told him it was an ambitious failure. Um, and he was like, cause he's humiliated by that movie. He took his name off of it. It says Alan Smithy. It wow. wasn't the movie he intended to make. Um, it was, yeah. I mean, like, it's a miracle that movie got finished. But I look at it now and I'm like, there's some really cool things about it. There are like cool ideas that were explored and there are new things that he added. But, um, I think at some point they'll do something that's more accurate to Dune. But Dune was kind of ripped off by James Cameron. I mean, Avatar is Dune, basically. Right. It really is much more, much closer to that than anything else. But without going into detail, just the idea of you saw a movie that you hated so much, it inspired you to create just a little zine. A movie that that had been built up in my mind to be a movie I had. Like, this was like that and Star Trek The Motion Picture was a movie that was a big deal to me growing up. Right. like, but the, but that was a similar kid. story too. Well, mm-hmm. no, I really like that because I thought that what they were going for, Star Trek mm-hmm. the Motion Picture for me is that and Star Trek 2. Star Trek 2 is the popular right. favorite one. Mm-hmm. I like Star Trek the Motion Picture because it felt like 2001. It felt like it was yeah. going for something more yeah, ambitious, right. more realistic. 
So, um, right. Yeah. But uh, a, a theme going across is doing things on your own, feeling passionate about something enough to do something rather than anybody today can be passionate and, and post on Facebook all they want. Well, but. I'm usually inspired by something and it's like, I just, I've had a weird career where I've been hired to do things like hired to do things on television and whatnot. And I'll get hired to write magazine articles or whatever. But, um, most of the projects that I've done that I'm most proud of are ones that are self-generated. Yeah. You know, it's like, I always, I look at people like struggling to, you know, get cast or this. And I'm like, just hire yourself. I think the only, the only thing I did I did write that I didn't actually intend to do is I didn't care. And so that attitude, I didn't care if I got hired on a TV show. And I think that right. attitude of not caring whether I got the job or not is what always helped me get the job is because I didn't want to do the job. So the less I wanted to do it, the more they wanted to hire me. My thanks as always to my co-host and producer, Alan Ng, and to this episode's guest, Chris Gore. You can follow Chris on Twitter and Instagram at ThatChrisGore. Visit his website at ThatChrisGore.com. You can see Chris at the 2016 San Diego Comic-Con. He'll be leading his DV Doosday Live panel on Thursday, July 22nd at 7 p.m. in room 25 ABC. You can follow us online at 5thingspodcast.com or on Facebook at facebook.com slash five things podcast that's f-i-v-e or on twitter at five things pod that's f-i-v-e-p-o-d thank you also to our sound engineer sammy junio of the hello lion face podcast network music by my monthly date subscribe to five things that changed your life on itunes google play stitcher or your favorite podcast service and go ahead and leave us a nice review if you'd like For five things that changed your life, I'm Lauren Kling.